<laughs> Spring is a joyful time for Abdul Wahid and his family. The opium poppies they have tended so carefully are ready for harvest. Soon the heroin middlemen will arrive to buy their entire crop. The village will make just enough money to survive another year. It's got high value and we get our food through it. The opium becomes a drug called heroin, which hurts many people in the West. Do you worry about what happens to the opium when it leaves here? We don't know what it's made into or what happens to the people. We're just solving our problems and we need it. Abdul's family is just one of 200,000 families in Afghanistan who now survive by growing opium. The United Nations estimates this year's crop will produce almost half the world's supply. The white sap will be dried and taken to secret laboratories to be processed into heroin. Within weeks, it will start to flood the West. It's no secret where the opium is produced in Afghanistan. We're just near the city of Jalalabad and we picked this village at random as we drove past and saw the poppy fields. And 90% of this year's crop has been grown on land controlled by the fundamentalist Taliban. The Taliban are a secretive movement founded on religious fanaticism and spread by warfare. In less than two years, they have conquered most of Afghanistan, imposing strict tribal customs in the name of Allah. Their involvement in drugs and the extent to which it has helped their war is a story the Taliban are not happy to be shown. The mullahs who control the movement have banned television as un-Islamic. To be caught filming in Taliban strongholds is to risk beating or arrest. So most of this story has been filmed in secret. As we found at their army's front line, their fanatics don't hesitate to use violence. Mr. Camera. Uh, you are a very crazy man. Well, we've just had to make a very quick escape from the front line because one of the Taliban arrived and saw us shooting and started throwing rocks at the camera. That is one un-Islamic practice that they are very strict about enforcing. But this is an acting clear breach of Islam they have allowed to flourish. More than 2,200 tonnes of opium crop have already been harvested. It will eventually produce more than 40 per cent of the world's heroin. Have the Taliban tried to stop you growing poppies? No. What's the body name? No, they have not stopped us. No problems? No. The Taliban claim to be as pure on drugs as they are on all other Islamic bans. Najibullah Shams is their minister for drug control. Unaware of our camera, he showed me posters and propaganda he said discouraged cultivation. Mr Shams even consented to a television interview, but he insisted the camera should be pointed away from him, so the sin of recording a living image would be ours, not his. According to Islam, the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad and Sharia law, the use, trafficking and planting of drugs are prohibited and this prohibition is at the top of our agenda. Certainly, the campaign against drugs is at the top of our agenda.
But the minister argued farmers should be exempt from the Islamic ban until the war was over. They take money and credit from the international drug traffickers only for the survival of their families. They are forced to plant for the sake of their families. Once order was restored, he said, and the country united, poppy cultivation would end. The establishment of central government in Afghanistan, the establishment of security and the establishment of law and order will be effective in stopping drugs like hashish and opium being cultivated. The Taliban's pragmatism toward opium is in stark contrast to their uncompromising stance on every other Islamic decree. They have dragged each captured province back to an idealised Islamic past. After just eight months of Taliban control, the once sophisticated capital Kabul looks more like a 19th century village. Western dress has been banned, along with music, smoking, alcohol, films, television, even kite flying. Women continue to be barred from jobs and education. Those found breaching even minor decrees are publicly beaten. Just today, we had a case where uh, two women were beaten outside of this office for wearing uh, sandals. Beaten by Taliban? Beaten by Taliban. Um, beaten by, uh, they have um, electric cord, which they beat the women with. Ross Everson represents 70 foreign aid agencies based in Kabul. His dealings with Taliban officials leave him cynical about their promise to curb drugs. Too many Taliban believe that they are hurting the West with these poppies. This is what the common Taliban will tell you. I don't, I'm not saying that this is what the, uh, the people from the, in the top of the Taliban, but the common man believes that we are hurting the, hurting the Americans by these uh, poppies. So they see it as a good thing? Yes, definitely, definitely. Some of them definitely see a good thing. They're very happy about it. Afghanistan's opium dependence is a direct legacy of almost two decades of war. The fighting against Soviet invaders, and later between militias backed by neighbouring countries, has shattered the economy, destroyed the towns, and devastated the rural communities. Abdul's village is typical of the privations farmers face. There is no money for irrigation, so the only crop they can afford to grow is poppy. There is not much water here, but this crop needs less. Other crops need more. They would die of thirst. The Taliban's tolerance of opium has helped their military advance. Last year, before the Taliban invaded this area, the local Mujahideen tried to stop the poppy harvest. The community revolted and welcomed in the Taliban. If the Taliban do the same thing, the people will rise up against them and there will once again be anarchy. But the Taliban's involvement in drugs goes beyond mere tolerance. They also have a direct financial stake in the trade continuing. Opium is by far the most valuable crop Afghanistan produces. In each area they have conquered, the Taliban have imposed a 10% tax on the proceeds of opium sales. We used to pay the tax before, but not since the years of revolution and anarchy. Now the Taliban are collecting the tax again. The Taliban will be charging the farmers a tax on the crop they have produced. Does that mean the Taliban are profiting from drugs? This type of arrangement by the Taliban has been practiced for hundreds of years, not only in Afghanistan, but in other Islamic countries. With almost every opium farm now under Taliban control, the United Nations has become dependent on Taliban cooperation. 
poppy cultivation. Gary Lewis heads the drug control program in neighbouring Pakistan. He's been allowed to survey drug farms, measure their likely yield and computerise their location. He has not been able to stop them. It's just as frustrating as seeing your son or daughter addicted to, to heroin knowing that uh, they, they have, if they can find the wherewithal within themselves, they have the potential to withdraw themselves from that situation, but they choose not to do it. And uh, they, they have to be helped out of that situation. The UN estimates the farmers could be persuaded to switch to other crops at a relatively minor cost. Afghanistan's total farm income is less than $100 million a year. The drug farmers see little of the fortunes made by crime barons who sell their crop. Abdul took us back to his simple mud brick home at the edge of the poppy fields. He said he would willingly farm something else if he just had the money. You're not a wealthy man from growing poppies. What can we do? We are poor people and we cannot survive on other crops. There is not enough water in our village. We need water. If we get enough water, then we could grow rice, melons and vegetables. But the war has become an ongoing excuse for the Taliban leaving things as they are. They're focused on their war, and they are focused on winning it, and they believe that they, they, they have a destiny to do so. Everything else will come afterwards. <laughs> the Taliban's war shows no sign of ending. Neither they nor the two main opposition forces who control the north are in a mood for compromise. On a second visit to the front line, we were able to talk to one of the Taliban militias out of sight of their fundamentalist commanders. They were in high spirits and confident of winning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This, this will win the war for you. <laughs> Do you think the Taliban will eventually rule all of Afghanistan? Oh, yes, we will. But just one week earlier, the Taliban had suffered their worst ever defeat. The former government army, led by Ahmad Shah Massoud, broke out of the Panjshir Valley, where they had been holed up for eight months. They have now trapped more than 2,000 Taliban soldiers in the north and are attacking Taliban positions to the south. Their defeat has cast serious doubt on their ability to ever win the war, the precondition they have set for ending the opium trade. Massoud has already banned opium in the areas he controls, leaving the Taliban as the only significant faction allowing widespread opium production. Tell me again, you are from Egypt, aren't exactly. you? Yes. The UN special envoy to Afghanistan, Norbert Hall, has tried and failed to persuade the parties to negotiate. He believes the past month has proven the Taliban cannot unite the country by force. I would not totally rule out a possibility of a military takeover of one side or the other, over the whole territory. But what the events have shown is that even such a military takeover would not lead to stability. It would lead to political instability. Dr. Hall, the other thing that is happening in the midst of this crisis is the harvesting of a record opium crop, which is a major security worry for the rest of the world. Are you satisfied with the Taliban's efforts to eradicate opium? Can you see any progress unless this conflict is settled? I think we all agree that this situation is not at all satisfactory and that we have a lot of uh, lip servicing uh, when we ask that kind of questions to all the parties. In Abdul's village, they've ceased believing that anything will change. The children are already learning the craft of producing opium. Islamuddine is just 12 years old, but he has no doubt what he'll do when he grows up. I have to grow opium. 
There are no schools to go to. What else can I do? Do you think growing opium is a good thing or a bad thing? It is good for poor people, but not good for the rich. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As I left the village, I was given a parting gift with a pointed message. It is the gift of death, enough to kill you. For Afghanistan, opium production brings profit, not misery. The people rarely see the damage it causes other countries, and few seem to care. Foreigners brought death and misery to their country and plunged it into endless war. In the eyes of many Afghans, they are now reaping its deadly harvest.